listening to Where We Fit, a podcast that shines a light on the unique paths and voices in the marketing communication field brought to you by the CCNYAAF student chapter. I'm your co-host, Frederick Knapp. I, in addition to this, host another podcast, uh, The Afternoon Nap, where, we, where we, uh, we, we go over film and entertainment news. I'm a junior here at City College, and I'm here with my co-host, Azari. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, it's good morning. My apologies. Uh, my name is Hazari Ren Glover. I'm a senior here at CCNY and one of the hosts of the AAF. And tonight, to- I'm messing up all kinds of days. But today, this morning, we are sitting here with the wonderful Maria Del Pilar Casal, a media professional and vice president at digital uh, vice president of digital partnerships at Univision. Maria, how are you doing today? Good morning. And now that I see your mic, I forgot that I had a mic. I should have used for this. I have a mic that's been sitting in my like props closet for a little while and I missed the opportunity to pull it out. Oh man, oh, that's okay. You still sound great. You're coming across okay. fantastic. So let's get started with a couple of questions, shall we? Okay. Uh, we know that, you know, we went through um, with your education, you kind of came into CCNY kind of like on the brink of the <laughs> academic year. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got into the ad PR program? Yeah, so I always kind of like um, semi regret that when I was graduating from high school, I probably could have applied directly to City College and it would have been an easier process and maybe I could have even um, done the CUNY Honors Program, but I ended up here nevertheless, so it worked out. I actually went to a private school, a private Catholic school in Pittsburgh um, my first year of university. I'm not sure why. I don't really remember my thinking. I remember thinking just kind of, oh, they have a PR program. And ironically, I think every university and college in the country has a PR program. So I don't know why I went all the way out there. Um, I also didn't realize at the time that Pittsburgh is like on the other side of Pennsylvania. I was thinking Philly. Uh, And then it took us eight hours to get there driving. And I realized I was heading out pretty far. Um, But I was there for a year and it just kind of wasn't the right fit. I was really missing New York. And I think a lot of the things that we're used to um, in New York that a decade or more ago, Pittsburgh didn't quite have. Um, And so last minute I decided I wasn't going to go back. I had like paid the first semester. So thank you to my parents. (laughs) Still owe them money. (laughs) Uh, But I decided I wasn't going to go back. And, you know, my parents, I think being very typical Latino parents were like, well, you're going somewhere. If you're not going there, you're going somewhere. And I had gone to Hunter and um, Baruch because they were the schools that I was familiar with from just like growing up. People I knew went there and their admission was all closed out. And so my mom had gone to City College. She said, go to City College, talk to them and tell them you need to like go to school somewhere. And so I went there and I went to the um, admissions office and I remember being like, please, my parents will kill me. It was like August 28th, I think. And I was like, I don't want to go back to Pittsburgh. I don't want to go back to the school. Like, please, my parents will kill me if I'm not enrolled somewhere. Can I go here? And I was just like, I'm a really good student. I promise you if I had applied, like you would have taken me. And I don't know if it's like allowed. I don't know if someone just did something on a paper, but they were like, you're here, you can go. And I think the next day I had classes. So they like, you know, told me I had to go like online the portal and I signed up for what I could. And then that's how I ended up at City College. And I remember I was talking to Professor Applebaum and again, being much more familiar with like Hunter and Baruch, I told her, oh, I think I'm going to transfer. Maybe I'll go to Rutgers. I was kind of talking to her. And she said to me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, something in communications or in PR, I'm not sure yet. You know, maybe I'll be a lobbyist, but I just really like to kind of craft stories. And I was telling her about myself. And she said, well, the best CUNY school to do that at, and one of the best schools, I, she said, I think, in New York to do that at, is right here. So why would you transfer? And I said, OK. Uh, and she signed me up into the MCA program. And she was like, these are the courses you need to start taking next semester and help me kind of sort out with what I had done at my prior school. And then I stayed. And I loved it and I'm so grateful. And so much happened um, because of all of like these things that led to it, but I like, I'm engaged now to the person I met when I was at City College, some of my best friends. So it was, it was accidental, but I think really intended for me um, in the long term. Like it was a part, it was always gonna be a part of my life story. I, think. I, I knew that uh, City College for me was very similar safe haven. Like I had a lot of other experiences at other colleges. And, I, and then I was like, I just, I need to get a degree. I need to go somewhere that I, I know they'll take care of me. And I, re- I really felt that from City College. 
that is like the perfect, I think, term for it where you said safe haven. So one of the things, and I, and you know, I share this very openly. One of the things that was really difficult about the school that I was at in Pittsburgh is that it was a very much, it was almost a completely white institution. I remember, so I'm Puerto Rican and Argentine. I'm from New York. And I remember I got there and there were some, there were three students and they were from Puerto Rico. And I remember they were white. And I thought even Puerto Rican students here are also um, white. And it was just this really kind of, it was something that I wasn't aware of. I think I'd already, I'd always been kind of in different um, groups of people. You know, I grew up in an Italian American neighborhood, right? So I was used to there, I think kind of like they identified me in certain ways. I identified in certain ways. I've gone to a predominantly white and Asian high school. So I'd always kind of moved in these circles and my identity had kind of ebbed and flowed and been informed by those experiences. That, that university was the first time where someone told me like who I was. Like they very much identified me as like, you know, we're this and you're this. Um, mm. whether intentional or just kind of what the culture was there at the time. And so I, for the first time, really felt on the outside. Part of that also, I think, being a privilege of being, you know, a fair-skinned Latina growing up in New York, where I didn't feel different in a lot of um, uh, different environments where I was in, where to be fair for other people, they probably did. But it was the first time where I was kind of put in that, really identified in that way. And I understood, I think, at the age of 18, oh, I'm not welcome here, right? Or I didn't feel um, that I was. And so when I got to City College, I remember probably like after my first class, I came into the rotunda and somebody was playing, I think like bachata or something. You know, they, I don't know if they still do this, but they were like, there was like a DJ in the rotunda and everyone was out. And I just remember being like, oh, no one's going to say anything here when they hear like my name. Like when I say my name is Pilar, like no one's going to react to that. Or when I talk about being from the Bronx, no one's going to have a reaction to that, that, right? And it was just like radically, you know, I'm not gonna be in a class and someone's not gonna make a really uncomfortable comment about like immigration or about why don't people speak, like those kinds of things that I was constantly hearing. Um, and so for me, it was very much like a, a, a safe haven. It was also a big learning um, experience in general in City College where I kind of started to, you know, just learn more about identity and where my place was in that, and, you know, how I can do better and all of those things. But it was a safe haven. It was like coming back home Ironically, a place I'd never been, but it was like coming back home for me. And I'm eternally grateful to City College for that. Yeah, absolutely. So I resonate with that a lot. Um, growing up on Staten Island, uh, the population is predominantly uh, like Catholic Italian. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's hard. It was hard when I was younger. I didn't really mm -hmm. recognize it. But then growing up and going to the city more often and then coming back, it's like, yeah, you don't really, even though nobody outwardly is like, you don't belong here, you still don't really feel like you do to some degree and, yeah. and so I, I get that going to City College definitely feels more at home like I feel more at home in that area in City College with the people there because it feels like they understand where I'm coming from they understand what I've been through and we can relate on, on that same yeah. level and everybody is is working to better themselves regardless of where they're coming from and that's yeah. the one mindset that I really appreciate about City College for sure I, I noticed that you went to, you did online business school at Harvard while dealing with the pandemic, while working full time. I, that's the definition of hustle to me. Like it, I would love it. I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. It, you know, it was a lot more intense than I expected. So it's a three and, and to be fair. So there's Harvard business school, right. That you apply to when you spend like, you know, whether it's two years or whatever, um, that it may be. This is an online um, executive program, right? So everyone can apply to it. And it lasts about like three and a half months, I think it was, or almost four months. And so it's three part course. There's finance, there's economics, and then there's like business analytics. And I was one of those people who was one, you know, grateful, very lucky to work from home. But I got kind of sucked into that, like, I should be doing more with my time. I should like, what do I do? I can't go anywhere. Like, how do I kind of put this time into something? And um, Univision gives you, like, reimburses you for education. And, you know, my parents always tell me, like, like that's free money. You got to use that. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. any, like, anything that anyone mm -hmm. will give you, you have to use it or else you're losing money, even if it was not your money to begin with. So my mom would always tell me, you lose, it's like $5,000 a year. She's like, you're losing $5,000 a year every year. <laughs> you use it. So I did, um, it was really, it was really interesting, right? It teaches you, I think, how to, how to think 
and how to get into a certain mindset that is very powered by like the the rules of uh, finance. It's also very interesting because again, I think um, it goes back to like everyone has kind of different world experiences. And so I had this moment where I was like, oh, okay, this is how I need to be articulating these, you know, X, Y, Z points to this person because this is how this person thinks. So whether I agree with this premise or not, or whether I think it should be the standard, this is how they're communicating and they're speaking this language and this is the way that I need to be expressing myself as well. So it was really um, helpful. It kind of, it helped me take the knowledge I'd already gotten and, and what I taught myself um, from the work that I do, but put it into that kind of more formal like financial language. But it was really intense. It was, I mean, it's, it's three courses and you have homework each week and you're studying each week. And uh, I don't know if I do it again. <laughs> it was a lot. But you're glad that you did. Yeah. Now that it's over and that I passed and my certificates mm. in the mail at my parents' house. Yes. Now, now I'm glad. The parents house. There you go. Mom, I didn't waste that money. See? <laughs> yeah. They also steal in my building. Let me tell you, people oh. will say all kinds of things because I'm from the Bronx. I'm like, well, I live in the Upper West Side now and they steal in my building. So I have to send all my stuff to my house, in the, to my parents' house in the Bronx, where it is very safe. Fair. That's fair. No one in the Bronx touches your shit. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's okay. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, <laughs> we're very, we're very friendly here. Uh, but um, one thing I wanted to, to kind of talk about was how you were doing all of this, uh, all this work with your full time job, as well as working on this degree and the certificate while through COVID and the pandemic. And I kind of wanted to touch on how that how you did it, how you persevered and and struggled through it, but ultimately came out on top because there are a lot of students here that will listen to the podcast that also are going through those kinds of struggles and going through that like currently now as well as prior to and some yeah. took the year off because they needed that in-person mm -hmm. interaction and some struggled through that year to make it through and I think that's something that they would very much like to hear about. Yeah I think well so the first thing that's always really important to me when I talk about kind of how I experience and well the pandemic's still going on right but how I experienced that lockdown time is to really acknowledge that I was very lucky and that I was able, I had a certain level of job security and I was able to work from home, which for so many people, that part alone um, was probably, you know, outside, and, and on the health front, right? That everyone, myself and everyone I love um, was healthy. So I was very, very lucky and so grateful for that. I think, you know, and we were talking about this earlier, I think I got caught up a lot in the, how do I make myself my most efficient self and come out of this pandemic really great. And honestly, it was very difficult. And that's why I say, I don't know that I would do like a class again. Um, I think if we ever had this experience again, I'd probably sleep more and just rest because I definitely found myself really struggling. Like at a certain point, I think by the time I took the class, we've been a few, it'd been maybe like eight months, um, in, so I had a little bit of time to recover from that, but it was a very, very difficult time ironically just like probably right around when it all um or rather I, I think it was a few months after but I had started telling myself I want to like do therapy and so that was really helpful because it coincided that I started therapy right when we went into lockdown so I kind of had so you know somewhere to talk someone someone to talk to and kind of like a framework for how to deal um with things but I will be honest that it was probably it was very difficult for me I think I did the best that I could um they tell me I did a good job at work. You know, I think it's more probably because I was doing, if I'm honest, a really terrible job personally. And, and I think personally I, I struggled, right? And I was, it, it's just, it was just very hard. And I think a lot of people, we want to kind of be like, oh, it was fine. I got through it. But honestly, it was very emotional. It was difficult. Mm -hmm. I cried a lot. I cried in some work meetings. Luckily, it was <laughs> amongst colleagues. But yeah, it was a difficult time. Let's see. Next questions. As we move forward, uh, you've worked with Univision Communications since uh, about 2012, right? Yes, yes, so, um, on and off. had many roles working in, in that industry. Uh, what could you tell us about your start at Univision uh, and how you built yourself up to becoming what you are now as the vice president of the digital partnerships? Sounds so fancy when you say it. Yeah, so I think there's like a lot of things I could say, but I'll just do like random kind of things that stand out and hopefully they'll sure. be helpful to people. First, I think it's my how I started um, at Univision. Univision was my first like corporate job. 
prior to that, I was working in fashion. I was working in the bridal industry. I was doing a lot of freelance um, work, just like marketing, PR, and website design um, for different folks. And I think the job I had right before, I was with a bridal designer who actually, I ended up working for her, but her daughter went to City College with me. And I had no idea. Like, we were friends, and we had no idea. Oh, exactly. She just, oh, yeah, her wow. mom connected the dots. Yeah. But so I ended up at Univision because I had linked up with this temp agency. It was a recruiting agency, actually. They, they would they place like full time and temp roles, but they specialize in temp roles. And so they um, had called me and were like, hey, you work in fashion and you work in bridal. Can you steam dresses like Vera Wang needs someone for some show that they were doing? Or I think it might have been like around bridal week, which is after the fashion weeks. And so I did something which I probably wouldn't recommend to other folks is I think you should always just say yes to everything and figure it out later. I was like, I can't go to Vera Wang and steam dresses. I've never seen the dress. Like these dresses are tens of thousands of dollars. I burned this like I'm going to be screwed. So I was like, no, I'm so sorry. I do not know how to steam. I said, but um, I know how to do all these other things. Now, looking back, I would have just said yes. Because like you can Google on YouTube how to steam dress. And also YouTube is bigger now than it was back then. But so I was like, no, I don't know how to do this. Um, I know how to do these other things. And so she told me, oh, you know what? Univision needs temps for their corporate communications department to you. And they need someone with social experience. Do you write in Spanish? And I was like, yes, I absolutely do. And like, here's my blog where i tweet and i post facebook and whatever so that's how i got connected to Univision was through a temporal and at the time um that team had all temp so they would test you out for a few months and then they would give you a full-time role and so that's what happened uh to me and i'm pretty certain the reason that i got that job outside of writing in spanish um was because there was like one tool at the time that all the companies used to schedule and like to create content to schedule it uh, it was a um, a scheduling platform it's called hootsuite it's still around it's a canadian company they're based in toronto and i knew how to use that because when i was in city college i had started a blog again because like the hustle mentality everyone had before like side hustles were a thing i think everyone in city college was like working on some big project outside of like school we all wanted to like do something it's like you know i'm studying to be a teacher but really like i have a rap career and i was like i'm studying to be in comm but really i have like a fashion career right we were all like i, I want to be a fashion person and so I had created a blog and I was writing on it and I would use this tool to schedule um, content and like try to drive traffic to the site. And so that was the tool that they used to schedule all of Univision's content at that time. And so I think between the fact that I wrote Spanish and she, my boss at the time, wouldn't have to train me on that tool, they were like, you can have the job. <laughs> so that was one of my big learning lessons, by the way, which is that um, don't like, don't undervalue the stuff that you've self-taught you or kind of different types of experiences sometimes don't line up with the job description exactly because some, sometimes something like that's so simple like you don't have to spend a week training me how to use this tool i already can do it it's like such a relief to hiring managers um because otherwise i didn't i didn't have you know i was coming from fashion i didn't have corporate experience this was like a building with everyone in suits super serious big media mm -hmm. company and i was like oh, i do websites and blog and <laughs> whatever maybe but that's how i started there um, I just want to take a step back. Uh, do you know if they still have the same approach to uh, to temps that like, you know, we want to move them to full time or? So I'll tell you this. I think now there's more kind of a freelancer economy. So what do they call it? Like gig economy. But now it's more like freelancers. So there's a lot of people who have stepped away from corporate and have like full portfolios. So they'll do project based work. Um, I don't know if at Univision, I don't think so. That was at a time, I think companies will do that when they're building out a team and they kind of need to get a sense um, of people. But I think the market's changed a lot um, since then. Uh, and I don't know if they, if that kind of like temporary workers still for media. Um, but I do think you should stay open to it. So for example, and it made sense at the time um, because I was freelancing in other areas, but it wasn't like super glamorous at the beginning. Like I was going to go temp and you know, I was writing, I mean, I thought it was super exciting to write tweets for Univision. I was like, I'm at Univision. This is amazing. Um, was but there it an expectation? From, like, a I'm, I'm just wondering, when you guys were there, was there a real expectation of, like, you're going to be full-time? Because I don't feel like we have that that now anymore in the modern day. Yeah, there was definitely 100, or whether there was an expectation on my end or when I got there, it was like, here's the deal um it's you know they, they communicated months. it to you yeah. that like this and, is an expectation you can have 
yeah, like we're testing you out. And if it works out, they'd like fired like three people before me. So it was like, if this works Ooh. out, then the plan is to hire you. The important thing, which I did not know, and people should know, is that if you come in through like a freelancer tech agency, there's the rate you're being paid by the company, but then the company's paying a margin on top of that for the services that the temp agency does of like oh. your payroll and managing you. So when you go to, if you are temping and you're gonna become full time, or if you're freelancing, you're gonna become full time, whatever you're making, you need to bump up like another 30%, right? And then negotiate above well, that. That's a big because, bump, okay. Yeah, cause it's about a 20 to 30% fee that you pay on, um, on when you have temp. So like, for example, and I won't put numbers, I don't want to do math like live on the spot, but if you're making X, so if you're, let's say making $12, whoa, can you, $12 is like my first. Okay, it's I like got the calculator, old, old I'm ready. Numbers. But so let's say, um, let's say we'll do $10, so I don't have to do math. So if you're doing $10, right, uh, let's say that's what you're getting paid, which is not, no one should take $10, please negotiate way higher, but this is so I can do the math. So if you're doing $10, right, they're going to charge um, the company 13 right? And They'll say like, oh, we don't take any part of your wages, which is technically true because they don't tell you like, hey, you make 13 and I take three. They say your rate is $10, but they charge a service fee to the company because they manage your payroll, they found you, et cetera. Um, so when you go to negotiate and you multiply, right? Okay, I'm making X amount of dollars. I work X amount of hours. Then you got to remember that once you're fully employed, they don't have to pay you overtime. So they're going to work you hard, right? They're really going to work you. So you got to multiply what overtime you think you're going to do. That's your number, but then you need to throw, throw that 30% on top or start out and adjust your rate for the 30% because mm -hmm. if you're a temp, that's what they were, that at minimum, that's what they were paying before. And if they're hiring you for a role, that means they really like you, you've proven yourself. So now somebody else that they could hire instead of you, ha they have no known experience with. You, they know you work great. That's why they're hiring the role. And literally day one, you hit the ground running. So you really have to bump up what you're asking for. And if you're a freelancer, you know that if they had to source another freelancer or use an agency to source those folks, they'd be paying those fees as well. So whether, even if they're not paying it for you, you know, that's an added burden and cost. You have to find someone else to pay someone to help them find someone else, et cetera. So I didn't know that. Someone from City College told me that when I met up with her years later. Um, I was like, oh, you know, I, I got full time. She was like, well, did you bump it up? And I'm like, no. She goes, oh, she goes, oh, how much were they paying you? She goes, they were probably paying, I think at the time they were paying me Eighteen dollars, I think, or they're like, oh, they're probably like twenty-four dollars to that agency. And I did um, find out later too that if you are contracted for a certain amount of time and they hire you before that time, they have to pay a fee out um, to the agency because, like, the agency's like, oh, lost wages because this person's great and I could have been making um, money. Which is sometimes why you're temping, they hold you out. Is there any real world advice that you could impart onto us younglings? <laughs> <laughs> Well, seriously, yeah. is there any like advice you've got for us the, as we're working into our starting our own career? Some of us, I guess, you know, also have done that. But for those who might still be struggling, for those who might still have questions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought about um, this. And I think I'm, I'm going to go like a little more maybe not so um, corporate outside of negotiate. And also like so I, I will put a blanket statement out there if you hit me up. I will share as much information if you are negotiating anything in a realm that I know. So you can DM me and I'll share. Um, I think for the kind of like stuff that I would share, just rem remind, I, you know, I've had ups and downs in my career and, and it feels weird saying ups and downs because I'm still so young and I'm starting out. But I think in whether it's in academics or um, in the professional world, you don't always kind of feel like you're at the top, right? Sometimes I think you have difficult moments, you have difficult jobs, difficult um, managers. I think it's really important to always realize that in the kind of span of your lifetime and the span of the work that you do, those moments are very small, right? So you can, I'll give you an example. And I usually don't talk about this. So I um, took a job at L'Oreal that I was extremely excited about. And I was only there for a few months. And then I came and I took um, the job that I have now at Univision. At the time, that switch felt to me like I was like, oh, I just showed my career. Look at this, like, got like the small piece on my resume is a little terrible. Fast forward now, in the world that we're living, people are job hopping. No one's ever questioned it. No one cares. Um, and so when you think about the kind of totality of who you are as a student, who you are as a worker, those moments of like, 
you know, I didn't get that job that I want, or that's very, very small, or whether, you know, you're really excelling in school or you're not, those things are just such small details of who you are just like as a human being. Right. And your story of yourself is whatever you want that story to be. And it's so much broader than any one moment or one failure, you know, and what really is even failure, right. It's, you didn't quite hit the goal. You just try again. Um, but I would say not to dwell or worry so much uh, about that. And I think to know that you can craft your own story, right? Who you are and who you put out into the world is who you say it is. And, and you decide what you share and anyone else's narrative about you isn't the narrative that you have to own, right? You make that um, yourself. I think too, though, to students, I would encourage, I think I worked really, really hard and, you know, I was studying and interning and working. And I think that's the reality of a lot of students um, at City College. You know, I'm very lucky and grateful that my parents supported me financially. I don't think everyone has that, but I think at City College, you find folks who are really doing a lot and working very hard. So I think it's finding time to relieve pressure off of yourself. And sometimes that means, you know, it's an assignment that's not going to get an A maybe, or you just got to kind of find that wiggle room for yourself and release some of that pressure because college should be also a time to get to know yourself and, and have fun. And obviously that's a luxury that not everyone um, can afford, but if you can, I think you have to make room and space for that. I had so much fun in college. I wish I'd had more fun. Honestly, I wish I'd worked um, a little bit less um, and not worried so much about like, I got an intern, I got to do all of these um, things. But yeah, I think those would be the, the two. Is that, I don't know if that's like helpful or, or good advice and negotiate your salary. <laughs> right. Number one. <laughs> Number one, negotiate the salary. If you're not in a situation where need requires it, I really encourage folks to be very mindful of how um, they spend. I think credit cards and stuff can be very dangerous in college. Um, with a caveat that I don't think by like not, by, it's like the whole thing like, oh, okay, I didn't get a coffee, so like now I can buy a house. Not that at all. Um, but I think sometimes when you're young, you kind of want to keep up in certain ways with people, like things you kind of want and while you have to make sure you're still, you know, enjoying your life, saving even a little bit. And in your first job doing, if you can, right. If, if your salary and if your bills allow for it, if you mm -hmm. can do at least the retirement that the company will match, like that as a minimum, that stuff multiplies like over 10 years and you take mm -hmm. your retirement fund wherever you go. So that stuff like, so if you're in corporate, right, if you're in a nine to five, that stuff multiplies um, everywhere. So on that note, Maria Del Pilar Casal. You say it so beautifully. Very, very much. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. This is thank so fantastic. Oh, it was our pleasure. Pleasure having you. An absolute no, you pleasure. guys are phenomenal. I have to say, I think you're so fantastic at this. Just like even, um, and I don't know if I'm breaking the fourth wall, but like in organizing this and putting everything together, you're all just um, just like such amazing uh, professionals. I'm not surprised. Um, so you all come from um, from CCN Live, but you just you're really great. And shout out to you for you know, doing the studying and um, doing this. I, I was telling you, like, I already feel like you guys, like if I had to compete with you guys in the job market, you were already like better candidates because you've got this whole other, um, oh, no. <laughs> you know oh, no. so much. So no, congrats, it's super impressive. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule for coming and being on the podcast. This was fantastic, oh, so I had a great time. And an yeah. extra thank you for having a real conversation about finances. I, it's, yeah, as sure. I've said before, it just, we don't do it enough. Well, and I'll give you guys, um, I'll open myself up now and however it works best, you can like channel it um, to folks. But my, I like to say my DMs are open. You find me on Instagram for professional work things. Um, but feel free to reach out. Like I say that open blanket to anyone listening to this. Where I can help, I will help. Um, you know, if there's a role you're seeing on the corporate site, it, Univision, let me know. I'm happy uh, to refer you or, you know, a 15 minute chat. Hey, I'm thinking of getting into media. I don't know, et cetera. I'm part of your alumni um, group, you know, um, and I always say first dibs um, to CCNY folks. So I'm happy to make myself uh, available. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I think we're wrapped.